for Vancouver Quadra. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and um, I'm very pleased to enter the debate that's based on the Opposition Day motion on First Nations water in First Nations community. Uh, we we uh, have identified this as an issue whose time has come to solve it, and uh, the leader of the Liberal Party of Canada this morning spoke very clearly about uh, the fact that there has been uh, inadequate attention to this uh, by parties across, by all parties uh, over the years. And uh, we can argue who has done good things and who hasn't done good things, but he, his plea was that we put partisanship aside and we recognize together that this is something that we can no longer have the reasons why we're not resolving uh, the problem. Uh, and this, the problem is the inequity in terms of access to safe, clean drinking water and wastewater uh, treatment in First Nations communities uh, compared with uh, non-Aboriginal communities. Uh, Madam Speaker, I, I couldn't agree more. This is uh, an issue that uh, all members of Parliament care about. It's a humanitarian issue. It's an equity issue. It's about safety. It's about, it's about lives, saving lives. And it just takes political will. And so that's what this motion does. It invites members of Parliament to agree that the time to solve this problem is now. Um, all levels of government share responsibility for ensuring that can, all Canadians have reliable access to clean, safe drinking water. But what we must do immediately, immediately, is have a strategy for drinking water in Aboriginal communities, and we need action, relevant action to deal with this unacceptable situation. Problems uh, in Canada. And uh, water is a very, very complex issue. The delivery of safe and clean wa uh, drinking water uh, is extremely complex. And Madam Speaker, I learned that in my first year as a Minister of Environment in British Columbia, we had far too many boil water advisories in British Columbia. And so as the Environment Minister, I worked with the Health Minister to look at our drinking water approach. We had a panel that was headed up by uh, Mr. David Marshall, who was the chair of the Fraser, Fraser Basin Council. That panel of, of experts assessed uh, a, a, a proposed new drinking water act, gave feedback to the government, and that act was duly passed, including a drinking, safe drinking water action plan. Um, one of the things that that action plan did is to address the cumulative impacts on water. And what it did is it gave communities the power, when there was concerns about cumulative impacts on water, it gave the communities the power to bring industry, the municipal government, uh, non-governmental non organizations and government departments together to develop a plan for addressing those cumulative impacts and the regulations gave the government uh, some teeth for actually making sure that the, that the challenges to a safe, safe and clean water were addressed. So I'm aware through having gone through that process uh, of the, the great complexities uh, that plague us with having safe and uh, running water, safe drinking water in communities across our vast and uh, geographically a very extensive nation. So the regu regulatory and legislative gaps are, are still rife, uh, despite the fact that many provinces and the federal government have, have uh, made efforts to address that issue. Federal-provincial jurisdiction is always a challenge when the federal governments want to uh, ensure that they are not stepping into a provincial jurisdiction, and provincial governments uh, may be waiting for the federal government to take leadership. 
Pro provinces and gov federal governments do work together often in a constructive way, and the leader of the Liberal Party pointed out that the government of Ontario, when he was Premier, worked with the Liberal government here in Ottawa to address uh, issues of inequity and inequitable access to, to uh, safe water and, and infrastructure on Aboriginal communities. So federal provincial juris sharing of jurisdiction, which water is a classic example of that, does not need to mean inaction or ineffectiveness. It just needs to be addressed in the development of the strategy and it means working with the provinces to solve this problem, which by the way, I would not consider that a great strength of the current Conservative government. Consultation with provinces in matters such as their Crime Bill C-10 and other matters has been completely missing. And it certainly would be necessary in a, in a water strategy such as the Liberals are proposing in this motion. There is an infrastructure deficit across, across Canada in... Uh, all categories of infrastructure and we know that municipalities small large uh, alike have come to the federal government and saying and, and and reinforcing the concern that it's the federal government that has the major ability to tax some uh, um, the majority of the percentage of taxes that are levied are federal government taxes, but the majority of infrastructure is the municipality's responsibility to provide. So there's a mismatch there. And we in fact have uh, over a uh, billion dollars in new funding needed immediately and $4.7 billion over the next 10 years needed to upgrade water and wastewater infrastructure to existing standards. Um, according to uh, a national roll-up report regarding First Nations reserves. So $4.7 billion over 10 years is what it take, would take to address this problem. And that's, that's significant resources. It's significant at a time uh, that uh, Canada is facing a slowdown in its economy. Uh, it's facing the fact that we've not yet made up the lost uh, half a million full-time jobs, that um, net jobs that we've lost since before the recession. But, Madam Speaker, let's put this into perspective. What is the cost to the Treasury of the next reduction of taxes for the large and profitable corporations when their rate will be going down from 16.5 to 15 percent? Uh, I was at a breakfast this morning with a very uh, eminent economist, uh, Mr. Jack Mintz from, the, from Alberta, and when asked about corporate uh, tax rates, his view is that our corporate tax rates are appropriate right now. They're far lower than the United States, and he was not calling for additional tax reductions. So this government is planning to do a tax reduction from 16% to 15.5. That will be costing the Treasury well over the $4.7 billion in 10 years that is needed for First Nations waste, wastewater and uh, drinking water infrastructure. So just think, with a single decision, this government could say, yes, we'd like to reduce the taxes for, for corporations further, but we actually think it's more important to ensure that the First Nations living in communities without running water have safe drinking water and have waste disposal. Imagine that. Is this a government that could actually rethink its ideological decisions and actually do what is right to provide justice and equality and equity for our First Nations people? I hope so, Madam Speaker. Or think of this, what about, what about the new approach to crime, which would have harsher and longer sentences, and senten sentencing for young people uh, that, uh, that the criminologists and people in, the, in our criminal justice system say is very counterproductive. There's many aspects of Bill C-10 that are widely criticized by those criminology uh, professionals, uh, public safety professionals, and so on. And many, many Canadians are concerned about the increased criminalization of Canadians 
the effect that that will have on First Nations, because the, un the reality is that there is a high disproportion of First Nations in our jails, and under Bill C-10 that will be even worse. So we have been arguing that those funds should be put into the supports to prevent young Aboriginal people who come to the cities from ending up uh, breaking the law and going to prison, as opposed to longer prison sentences, more prison sentences, and inflexible sentencing. But suppose we were to take the $5 billion that the parliamentary budget officer estimated that even just one single one of the nine bills wrapped up, rolled up into this uh, government's crime agenda, $5 billion, let's take that and use it to upgrade the, the water infrastructure in remote First Nations communities, those communities that are carrying their water in buckets, and let's solve the problem rather than throwing more Aboriginal young people into jail. I note, I note that there are several uh, Conservative members opposite uh, here as I, I speak today, and I would, I would ask them to think about that. What makes more sense? To add more prisoners to our already overcrowded prisons? Prisoners who, 85% of whom cannot even access the treatment programs and drug treatment programs or anger management programs that they are required to do under their, under their corrections plans because of overcrowding. Prisons in which $120 million was added over five years for security, for dog teams, for, for ion scanners, for security experts. Why? Because the overcrowding leads to more criminal behavior in the prison. So this is a government that wants to further overcrowd the prisons, further have to dump money into security in the prisons, and yet is cutting the program for drug treatment in prisons. And this is only going to get worse and more expensive. How about if we take the funds that Canada will have to dedicate due to Bill C-10 to having overcrowded prisons, how about we take that and we use it to clean up uh, the problem of lack of access to running water in our First Nations communities. As of last year, 116 First Nation communities reserve communities across Canada were under a drinking water advisory. And these are drinking water advisories that on average are for a year long. You can't drink your water for a year. So what are you going to do? You're going to spend time boiling that water. You're going to use expensive diesel fuel or fuel that has in some cases been flown into your community to boil the water so you can drink it or else you may get sick and your children may get sick. That is completely unacceptable. T too many of these communities live in conditions that Canadians, when we go to other countries and we travel and we see some of the, of, uh, the communities without, without running water and without waste disposal, we are shocked. But we should be shocked into action to know that those communities are rampant in, our, in, in, uh, in Canada. So there's a, number of, uh, there's a number of things that lead to this, uh, to this problem, and uh, the, the government's response so far is what cutting the, the environmental monitoring program in Environment Canada. No, we need to be adding resources. It's, the answer is not regulation with no resources. These are communities that don't have resources. Um, uh, Madam Speaker, I want to just touch into um, some of the myths that we hold about water here in Canada. And I recently hosted a policy breakfast in Vancouver Quadra with a very uh, eminent recognized professor at UBC, Dr. Karen Bucker, and she's the author of a book about water called O Canada, and that's EAU Canada, that's been very highly regarded and has won awards. And Dr. Bucker came to my policy breakfast to talk on five myths about Canada's water. And, uh, and one of them is that we have the most abundant fresh water uh, anywhere, and that's not true. Uh, there are countries that have more fresh water, and, and certainly uh, on a 
a volume of water per square hectare, we're not, we're not near the top of the pack. The myth is that our water is clean, our fresh water is clean, and in, in fact, we, we lag in terms of the cleanliness of our water. And some of the, unfortunately, industrial developments we know are contaminating um, our water. Some of our farming practices, even in the Fraser Valley, uh, <clears throat> in, today, in today's uh, era of understanding the, the threats to groundwater of overusing fertilizer or mismanaging the, uh, um, the disposal uh, of, of sewage from, from livestock, we still are seeing the contamination of streams, of creeks that go into the Fraser River. We're having contamination of aquifers. So Canada's water is not as clean as we Canadian citizens would like to think. We also think that our, that our water is being, our waste is being treated before it goes back into the environment as it should be. And that, according to Dr. Bucker, also Canada has nothing to be proud of in terms of our wastewater treatment. Uh, treatment standards. There, there is a myth that our water is well regulated and that unfortunately is also untrue. Um, when I was the Minister of Environment in British Columbia, I discovered that British Columbia was called the Wild West for groundwater because there was absolutely zero regulation of groundwater. Anyone could put a well of any size anywhere and extract water from the ground without any regulatory oversight or without any rules. And so that's one of the things that I was able to do as a, as a provincial minister is introduce the first ever groundwater regulations in British Columbia. Uh, and lastly, according to Dr. Bucker, uh, people's conception about threats to our water in Canada is that uh, export of bulk water to the United States is the biggest threat. In fact, Dr. Bucker's view is that that is a low risk because the northern states in the United States uh, would prevent it because their water regulatory regimes are stronger than ours in Canada. And so really the risk is that we Canadians don't understand the, the depth and extent of, uh, of problems with our water supplies. But I want to get back to the the uh, situation of First Nations bearing the brunt of the ch challenges with having clean running water and, and uh, wastewater treatment. So lack of drinking water, lack of an an adequate sanitation and flush toilets. Uh, First Nations communities are 90% more likely to lack running water than other Canadian uh, non-First Nation homes. And there's currently, a, so just think about that, 90% more likely to not have running water than non-First Nation homes. That is simply unacceptable. We cannot allow that. In, in Canada, we are a country that has a medium rate of income inequality, Madam Speaker, but our income inequality is growing. And it's actually growing faster than income inequality in the United States. And this kind of neglect of, of, of uh, First Nations' basic health and safety and access to clean water contributes to income inequality. Because if families are spending their time and their effort, their resources, to do something that I in Vancouver Quadra can do by turning on a tap or flushing my toilet, then those families are not spending that time getting an edu completing high school or getting post-secondary education, finding a way to have jobs and, and economic opportunities in their communities. So, and we do see dramatic differential in our, differentials in our, our human and social conditions uh, in First Nations communities with, uh, with uh, lower economic uh, opportunities, uh, health, education, uh, longevity, infant child mortality, uh, uh, numbers of uh, community members in jail, etc., are unfortunately higher in First Nations communities. First Nations make up 2.7% of the adult population, <clears throat> but 18.5% of pr prison populations. And that is simply unacceptable, but it doesn't come out of the blue. It ties in to our inability or unwillingness as governments 
to put our shoulders to the wheel and work together and tackle this very basic, very basic determinant of a quality of life, which is to have safe running water and wastewater treatment. And Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, we need a real strategy, not just a list of problems, not just a list of goals. Uh, we, need to, we need to actually have the actions and have accountability for these actions and take care of this problem, and we need to start now. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments. Uh, the Honourable Member for Newton North Delta. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to thank my colleague for her presentation. Sitting here and listening, it's hard for me to believe that we're talking about Canada. And we're talking about children who live in Canada, who are using a bucket as a washroom, and the sewage is going out into open ditches, who don't have clean drinking water. And we're talking about a Canada where the gap between the rich and poor is getting wider. I see that in my own community. But I want to focus today on the Aboriginal students, young people. And I'm actually absolutely amazed that there is even a need for this debate, that the government isn't rushing out saying, we didn't know this was happening. We're just going to go out and fix this right now. They did that for banks. They fixed banks' problems, oil companies' problems, by giving them huge tax breaks and monies. And so my question to um, my colleague is, what are some concrete steps the government could take straight away to make sure that no child in Canada lives in these kind of conditions? Member for Vancouver Quadra. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the question. And I, what the government can do is say we are going to take the $5 billion over 10 years that, that will be required to get this job done, and we're going to dedicate that fund to do that. And we'll work with First Nations and the provinces to, uh, to map out the action to do that. But I, I, what I want to add to the fact that uh, a First Nation child is in the situation is that it is the federal government that is responsible in many cases for the situation. For example, the Tseke Dene in North Interior British Columbia in the Rocky, Ch Tr Rocky Mountain Trench are a people that used to have seven and a half million hectares that they occupied in their hunting and, and fishing lifestyle. When, the, when government came in uh, to build a dam in that area and to flood the, the richest bottom land, this community was moved by the then Department of Indian and Northern Affairs to a 13-hectare swamp land site on the side of Findlay, of, of Findlay Road, which was the logging road in the area, at 72 Mile. They were told, this is your new home. They were brought they were brought some stacks of three-quarter inch plywood and two-by-fours and told that they, there they could build their houses. And they had no infrastructure for sewage and water. They had plywood shacks without even any insulation. And that was the new community for the Seke Dene, thanks to INAC. That's the kind of thing that the federal government... Order, order, please. Order, order. I must give an opportunity for other members to ask questions. The Honourable Member for uh, Wetaskiwin. Thank you, uh, Just let me know, okay? Come on. There we go. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, Madam Speaker, I've listened intently. The Member for Vancouver Quadra has made numerous references to the publication uh, O Canada and uh, specifically to a piece authored by Dr. Backer. And Dr. Backer was clear that Canada needs uh, to strengthen the governance of water in Canada. So I want to ask the Member, does she support legal standards for drinking water? Uh, that other Canadians enjoy for the benefit of First Nations as well. The Honourable Member for Vancouver Quadra. Um, Madam Speaker, of course I support standards for drinking water, but that is only just the beginning. When we have a, when we have a federal government that years ago moved First Nations out of their traditional territory and put them into small reserves that were totally unsuitable, disrupted the ecologies of the game and the fish that was the basis of their, 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 life, their livelihoods, 
the government has a far greater responsibility than just to say, well, we'll have some standards. Far greater. Just to go back to the Tseke Dene, after a few years of trying to live in these uninsulated shacks with no services, have to drive up the road and get buckets of water out of the creek, they just upped and moved out and said, we're going to go back into the forest and try living our, our historic way again. And, and so that's what they did, because it was completely, it was just, it was completely uh, untenable to live in the reserve. How many of our First Nations had that very same situation? Uh, because the people, the representatives of the people of Canada took those kinds of, uh, of actions uh, to dismiss and deny their rights. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Davenport. Well, I listened very intently to uh, the Honourable Member, and, and uh, you know, this issue is not just uh, an issue uh, for Aboriginal people in Canada, although it is a crisis in their community. It's also a Canadian, pan-Canadian issue. It's an environmental issue, and it's not going to get uh, the, the attention that it needs if Environment Canada continues, with, if, if this government continues to cut and Environment Canada putting water inspection at risk, but we understand because the front bench of this government did the same thing when they were in the front bench of uh, the Harris government in the province of Ontario. They cut water inspection there and that led to a tragedy known as Walkerton to this day. So we, we, we are going to look very closely at whether this government is going to take the issues of water seriously, but I want to ask the member uh, from the Liberal Party, uh, why, after your party was in government for 12 years and didn't address this issue, how can uh, this House uh, really believe that, that, that your party is going to be serious about this issue now when you, when you certainly weren't serious about it, it wasn't on your agenda, when you were in government, when you could have actually done something about it? Uh, the Honourable Member for Vancouver Quadra. Well, Madam Speaker, I think the, uh, the Liberal leader very wisely called for this to be a debate about how to move forward on a, on a uh, critical issue. Hold but on. if the member wants to bring up the past, then I, I could ask why was the leader of his party the one that was responsible for bringing down a government that had actually, the, the, the Liberal government that had actually consulted with First Nations, consulted with the provinces over the course of a year and a half, and come up with the Kelowna Accord to address this very kind of issue. And it was his leader and his party that undermined that, uh, that accord and should take responsibility for that. Uh, questions and comments? Uh, questions and comments? Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Blanois Salaberry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think we all agree that the issue of access to drinking water and social housing is linked to that, of course, and all of the infrastructure that underlies that is a priority for Canada. On the other hand, there are several conditions that have been put forward by the Liberals that to this day are causing problems for access to clean drinking water, to their health and to their dignity. An example is that the uh, Liberals put a cap on federal spending for Aboriginals to a maximum of 2% per year, except for we know that uh, for inflation and uh, if you take into account the growing uh, Aboriginal population, that 2% cap creates uh, a decrease in the investments, in fact. So could my Liberal colleague and her party say if they are now going to support doing away with that 2% cap that they themselves put into place? Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I know it's not reasonable to expect that the member would have read the Liberal Party platform, but that was explicitly in the Liberal Party's platform. But what I would like that to, the, to uh, uh, I would like to make the comment that there's many things that need to be done in in Canada by governments, many. But let's focus here on the specifics of the of the uh, drinking water and wastewater 
uh, the um, infrastructure that's needed. That's what this motion's about. That's what we're asking the government to do and the uh, other parties to support. Um, I, I understand that there's many associated issues. Uh, one, of this, uh, one of the NDP members talked about environmental issues, and I had a whole uh, I, I have a whole a set of thoughts about how we've contributed to the drinking water problems by doing resource developments without proper consultation, without proper planning, <clears throat> and we continue to do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> For example, we're seeing the. We're seeing a pipeline proposal, a Northern Gateway proposal, where the First Nations are saying, we weren't consulted on this. So consultation is important. Preventing water-related problems from resource development is, 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 is critical. Uh, replenishing our forests uh, where, they are, where they are being devastated by global warming-related uh, uh, infestations like pine bark beetle. That's a critical for the hydrology. There's many things we can do on the environmental level.